I'm Nima Rajan, and this is Forum Daily Week in Review. New research says Canada's top three grocers have all posted higher gross profits this year compared with the last five years. And a lack of transparency in their financial results prevents the public from understanding where the extra profits are coming from. The report by Dalhousie University's Agri-Food Analytics Lab says Loblaw, Metro and Sobeys all recorded higher than average profits. But the report authors say that without more detailed data, it's difficult to explain why all three supermarket companies are exceeding their average performances this year. Samantha Taylor is a senior instructor of accounting at Dalhousie, and she says the publicly traded companies lump sales from grocery stores, drug stores, and other merchandise together. Now, this makes it impossible to tell whether grocers have increased food margins or whether consumers are spending more money on higher margin products, such as cosmetics and apparel. Well, Professor Taylor joins us now to tell us more about this. Ms. Taylor, welcome to Forum Daily. Hello. Thank you for having me, Nima. Now, an interesting term was uh, mentioned in your report, greedflation. So uh, let's start with that. What is greedflation? For sure. So greedflation is a term that's been used to discuss the amounts of profits charged by grocers or really anybody in excess of what would be typical um, by so-called taking advantage of higher inflationary times. And this report looks into the grocery industry in particular. So you're pointing that all three grocers are lumping sales from other product lines together. And this is making it virtually impossible to tell if grocers are increasing food margins. So, uh, Ms. Taylor, is this a dead end when it comes to this research? Uh, It really could be. um, Absolutely. So one thing that we did look at was how did each grocer compare to their gross profit? That is revenues, less cost of revenues relative to their last five years of performance. So we really wanted to dig into how they're doing in 2022 relative to their past. And what we found was interesting. So relative to each grocer's past average performance, um, each one of them is having a better year. However, only one of the grocers is having a better year versus their best performance of the past five years. So we are not left with, you know, conclusive evidence or, you know, really answers. But what we are left with are more questions. Why in a state when you know Canadians are paying more for housing, paying more for utilities, um, and paying more, you know, at the grocery stores, uh, why are in fact one of the grocers having, you know, on track to have one of their best record years ever? More questions indeed. Now, what other detailed data is needed in this investigation? And is it realistically available for researchers? I mean, Ideally, we would like to have the cost books and really get to see what the sales for individual items are and what the cost of those sales are. Is that realistic for researchers? No. Is that data that the companies have? Absolutely. So, you know, we really are, like you said, at a dead end. All right. Well, if we look at this report's conclusion, it mentions that unless companies open their books, you cannot prove or disapprove or disprove greedflation among Canadian grocers. So would it be in the public interest to force grocers to open their books? Uh, it definitely could be. Uh, however, there might be, you know, a little bit of a halfway point. You know, if perhaps grocers opened up more transparency as far as each segment, you know, so perhaps food, retail, uh, merchandising, and really helped us see each operating segment, not lumped in together, but really individually, that would provide us more answers. Um, Also, if they allowed, say, one of the big four auto firms to come in and do a test to specified procedures. So I really hesitate to recommend opening up the books completely because on the other side, we understand that grocers uh, and companies in general need profits in order to innovate and to bring food safety as a forefront to our, you know, our country. So I don't want to necessarily dissuade their competitive advantage, but I think consumers want more answers and we need data in order to give them more and better answers. All right, Ms. Taylor, looks like we've got about a minute left here, but we know the Competition Bureau is currently investigating the grocery sector in terms of competition in that sector. Uh, What are you hoping will come out of that uh, investigation? Ooh, I'm hoping for some answers, but honestly, it's not likely. Grocers are not compelled to give those costs of revenues, which would really help conclusively understand, really, is there excessive profit margins on food? And if so, where? 
So I'm not hopeful, um, but I'm optimistic that possibly grocers will, you know, come to the table with more data uh, for the Competition Bureau, for consumers in general, for researchers. Uh, I really hope that they, you know, back up uh, their words and uh, with some numbers. All right, Ms. Taylor, thank you again for joining us today on Forum Daily. Our interview with Ms. Shadi Sadr, Executive Director of Justice for Iran, is up next, so stay tuned. Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie has announced new sanctions against Iran's national police force and an Iranian international university. This is the fourth round of sanctions by Canada against the Iranian regime. The move on Monday comes in response to the Iranian government's continued crackdown on weeks of protests. The sanctions came the same day Iran announced that it would hold public trials for 1,000 people in Tehran over the protests, which began after the September 16th death of 22-year-old Masa Amini in the custody of the country's morality police. Well, joining us now to give us her take on the developing situation is Ms. Shah. Adi Sadr, Executive Director of Justice for Iran. Ms. Sadr, welcome to Forum Daily. Thank you for having me. Now, uh, how are you reacting to Canada's latest sanctions and how do you expect them to impact the ongoing crackdown on protesters? Well, in general, uh, uh, more sanctions on uh, perpetrators, uh, whether they are uh, in individuals or entities, are welcome. Uh, but we yet to see the real impact of those sanctions uh, that can uh, be uh, demonstrated in two things. One is the enforcement of those sanctions. Uh, for example, this international university, uh, Mustafa uh, International University, is a uh, uh, is an international entity. They have assets all over the world. Uh, what uh, would really uh, good to see after the uh, after designating this entity is uh, freezing the assets of this university and uh, having uh, uh, news about uh, like uh, real restrictions of the activities of those uh, who are involved in uh, gross human uh, committing gross human rights violations. And second thing is. Uh, 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 to extend the uh, sanctions to the individuals, to the relatives of those uh, who are per per perpetrators of gross human rights violations. So we know that uh, some of the perpetrators that are uh, already in the list of sanctions uh, by Canada or EU or US have relatives in uh, in Canada. And these individuals have uh, benefited from uh, the uh, uh, human rights uh, violations in Iran either financially or uh, um, other kind of privileges. So uh, un until and unless we see the real impact and enforcement of the sanctions, we cannot, uh, um, we cannot be very uh, positive about uh, designating uh, uh, human rights uh, perpetrators, human rights violators, because uh, in order to just uh, saying that uh, these sanctions are effective, we need to see them being enforced uh, properly and effectively. Mm -hmm. Clearly a lot uh, still needs to be done, Ms. Sadr. Now, we mentioned 1,000 people are being brought to public trial for their involvement in these protests. How do you expect these public trials to unfold? From what we know from uh, uh, previous experiences, there would be uh, show trials. Uh, the detainees wouldn't have access to uh, uh, the lawyers. And they are, as we speak, they are uh, under duress and pressure and torture, severe torture to confess uh, uh, against themselves and the other detainees, and also to repeat the narratives uh, uh, of uh, the governments that these protests are uh, led by the US or Israel or Saudi Arabia or uh, European countries agents. So this is what we would see in near future future in the show trial. So the detainees would come uh, to the stage one by one and under duress, they would actually uh, uh, repeat those forced confessions. All right, Ms. Sadr, just about a minute left here. But considering this is being called the biggest uprising since the Islamic revolution, do you see an end in sight for these protests? 
Uh, one thing that I can uh, say certainly is that this is the beginning of the end. Uh, the protesters, uh, um, despite the intensifying uh, pressure and crackdown, they are still in the streets and uh, they are determined to uh, overthrow the regime once and for all. All right, Ms. Nader, it looks like a quick 20 seconds left here. Before our Canadian viewers, what can they do to get involved? Um, I think ev everything that prevent this regime uh, from uh, continuing the bloodshed would be effective. So we need uh, uh, actions that really damage the Islamic Republic regime, actions such as expelling the ambassadors or uh, um, like diplomats of this regime from uh, different countries, actions such as uh, like uh, removing uh, the uh, Islamic Republic teams from uh, sports competitions, from cultural events. Uh, uh, any actions that uh, actually uh, uh, recognize the fact that this regime is no longer representing its people because a regime cannot represent its, uh, the people and killing them at the same time. A group of doctors are warning that Canada's health care system isn't prepared for the worsening effects of climate change. Now, this is especially considering the ongoing strains from the COVID-19 pandemic. Finola Hackett is a locum physician in southern Alberta and a co-author of a policy brief on climate health risk in Canada. Now, Dr. Hackett says ignoring climate-related health risks would be costly in terms of both dollars and lives. But taking action now could prevent disease and death. But what exactly are climate change related health risks and what steps can we take to prevent them? Joining us now to talk more on this is Dr. Abhishek Rout, Medical Director at Apple Tree Medical Group. Dr. Rout, welcome back to Forum Daily. Great to be here. Now, this is really interesting, Dr. Rout. When we think about climate change, we don't necessarily think about its impact on your overall health. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Right. So that's that's the important thing here. Climate change is now slowly being recognized as probably one of the greatest threats to human health in the 21st century. We're seeing climate related hazards already affecting the health of many Canadians. And we have a lot of evidence uh, to suggest that that's definitely going to grow. Uh, what we're seeing is an increase in morbidity and mortality. Uh, and, uh, and this is linked to a lot of greater frequency and severity of extreme weather events and natural hazards. So extreme heat, floods, wildfires, hurricanes, ice storms, and droughts. Uh, we also see that climate change can affect economic livelihoods and mental health. Uh, we see a lot of food shortages as well, uh, resulting in a lot of food insecurity. And the people that are most vulnerable to these health impacts tend to be seniors, children, infants, and uh, socially and economically disadvantaged people. Uh, and finally, chronic disease and compromised immune systems, indigenous populations tend to be also greater affected. And uh, just to bring this uh, towards Canada in particular, what kind of health risks do Canadian uh, or do Canadians uh, or are Canadians uh, risking in terms of climate change? Right. So we do have some reports, Canada specific. The Lancet report here underscores a little bit of those health risks, uh, pointing to the heat dome that settled over British Columbia, as we know, uh, in the summer of 2021 as a very classic example and a more recent example. That heat dome, which caused about 600 deaths in B.C., could have been virtually impossible uh, without the influence of climate change. So we're starting to see those play out as well. Hackett is a physician in Alberta. She also sees a lot of asthma and COPD, uh, which, which certainly is more prolonged in the air pollution from wildfire smoke as well. All right, Dr. Rao. Now, advocates are saying that the healthcare system isn't prepared for the worsening situation of climate change. Uh, so what is your take on this? Right. So I, I think the healthcare system has a lot of potential to increase that resilience to things like increased heat or floods or climate related health risks at all. But I don't think it's there yet. It's far from ready, uh, especially given the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, what we're seeing instead is that with climate related issues or disasters or catastrophes, we can see an increase in the number of emergency room visits by almost 10 to 15 percent. So this really causes an added strain right now to the already burdened uh, healthcare capacity. Capacity, and it does reduce the quality of care we have. And on that note, can you tell us a little bit more about the current state of our healthcare system, as you said, amid the pandemic and staffing shortages? Right. So, I mean, no one is surprised that what we're seeing is a, a, short, uh, a shortage on doctors and nurses as well. Uh, we, we've seen that many hospitals across the country have had to even close uh, 
uh, emergency departments for it. And Statistics Canada is showing that the first quarter of this year, nearly double of the uh, vacancies in healthcare that it was even two years ago. Uh, I think the stress of the pandemic and the increased workloads has really led to a, a high rate of burnout and uh, high rates of retirement and exits from the healthcare profession. All right, Dr. Rout, about uh, a little over a minute left here, but let's talk about some solutions. So what kind of steps can our officials take to prevent a total collapse of the healthcare system uh, due to these climate-related health risks? Right. So what we really need here is to coordinate the transformation of Canada's health system in the one that really keeps in mind climate change. So adaptation measures, uh, which look at specific climate risk training for healthcare workers and contingency plans for uh, disaster events as well would be very, very helpful here. And how can individual Canadians prepare for or protect against such health risks? So what we're seeing in general is that Canadians are understanding more about the risks of uh, climate change to health, which is great. Uh, in terms of actual measures, I think what we have to do is we, we've got to realize that we're still in the early phases here. Uh, we need to look at these links that we can do to have some national coordination. And that certainly can only happen when we advocate for it as a country. All right, Dr. Rout, always an informative interview. Thank you again for your time today. Thanks so much for having me. All right, when we return, we're going to be taking a look at interest rates and investing with Thomas Caldwell, chair of Caldwell Securities Limited. This comes after a big rate hike by the U.S. Federal Reserve. So stay with us for an important interview. We'll be right back with Forum Daily after a short break. The U.S. Federal Reserve raised its key interest rate, three quarters of a point, to a range of 3.75 to 4 percent yesterday. Now that's the highest rate in 15 years. It was the U.S. Central Bank's sixth rate hike so far this year. But the Fed is suggesting that it could soon reduce the size of the rate hikes, depending on the impact they have on economic growth and inflation. Well, joining us now to give us his take on these recent hikes is Thomas Caldwell, chair of Caldwell Securities Limited. Sir, welcome back to Forum Daily. Thank you, Neva. So what are your thoughts on uh, yesterday's rate hikes? Acceptable. Uh, I think I would have preferred to see him easing up on the increases. I know that sounds like a double negative. I would rather have seen a half of 1% than three quarters of 1%. But he did indicate that they will probably ease off a tiny bit. Uh, I find it very uh, quite ironic that the people who caused the inflation are now going to be the ones to solve the inflation. <laughs> Remember, it's been central banks that printed the money, drove interest rates down to nothing, enabled governments to spend um, significantly, causing inflation, and now they're doing exactly the opposite, as if somehow they've run into town and now are the saviors of this terrible thing that somehow it happened. So it's, it's a little bit ironic. Now, that's really interesting, sir. Uh, outside of the United States, how are these high interest rates uh, impacting other countries? Well, it's an indirect influence and it's devastating. What these high interest rates are doing is pushing up U.S. interest rates, obviously, but there's a lot of what they call hot money that roams around the world looking for the best short-term rates. And that money is flowing into the United States and pushing up the U.S. dollar. Uh, now, remember, less developed countries around the world have tremendous amounts of debt in U.S. dollars. So frankly, for the emerging world, this is devastating. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, a few countries have reminded the U.S. of the damage they're doing around the world. And uh, it really is, it's, it's very, very hard on them. So I don't know what, that, what the ramifications of that will be, but it is causing pain to less developed countries. And what about governments, sir? Do you think governments are doing their part to tackle inflation along with central banks by any chance? I think they're doing the opposite. I, I Maybe, you know, I graduated in economics and philosophy, which makes me functionally useless in the real world, of course. But from an economic point of view, the governments are spending money, more money, and they're saying, well, it's anti-inflationary. I mean, President Biden says we're, we're going to spend this money to help people deal with inflation. But that's part of the problem. Government's flooding the system with free cash for whatever purposes and whatever reason and somehow calling that anti-inflationary. It's not, it's pro-inflationary. So you got the governments, the administration with their foot on the gas and the central banks with their foot on the brake, which is counterintuitive. 
Uh, how this all works out will be quite interesting, but it, they're, they're both marching to quite different drummers at the present time. And it's, it's, it's interesting to watch how their verbiage, uh, doing the wrong thing, but if you put the right verbiage, it sounds better. And, and that's really where we're at. Uh, Canada seems to be trying to control deficits to some degree. Christopher Freeland's coming up with some measures, it seems, later on today. Um, some of them look like quite bizarre, frankly, but we'll see what they come up with. But basically, they're not in sync with central banks, as I can see it. All right, sir. Well, I'm going to ask you the question that I'm sure a lot of our viewers are thinking. Um, do you foresee an end or easing insight from central banks? Well, again, it sounds kind of perverse. It'll be an easing of the tightening, if that, if that makes sense to anybody. I, I think Mr. Powell already indicated that the next increases may not be at this level. I think they might uh, try to fine tune it a little bit. So you might see a few more increases, but I think they'll be smaller in magnitude. Remember, central banks have put the economies into the ash can on many occasions in the past because tightening money now doesn't have an impact for maybe 12 to 18 months. And they're hitting a target that's way out there and you don't know what the world is going to look like then. So you could be hitting with the impact of these measures at the worst possible time. So I think they're going to try to be a little bit more careful from here. Now remember, interest rates have come up from ridiculously low levels of literally zero interest rates to close to the 4%, say for Fed funds. That's not killer at this point in time, but they might have a few more little increases fine tuning it. But I, I think they're going to be careful at this point in time because they can do real damage six, 12, 18 months from now. Lots to keep our eyes on. Mr. Caldwell, always great having you on Forum Daily. Thank you again for your time today. Thank you, Nima. All the best. For more news on demand, you could always visit our website, thenewsforum.ca, and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok for updates. All right, thanks for joining us today, Canada, on the Forum Daily Week in Review, and we'll see you again next time.